The Profit Margin Written by Adam Argo Narrated by Bo Thomas Villagers should be stocking up on pitchforks and torches for that son of a bitch. He's my monster. I made him. Revolution time. La, la, la. Yeah. Wait till I get my money right. I had a dream I could buy my way to heaven. When I awoke, I spent that on a necklace. I told God I'd be back in a second. Man, it's hard not to act reckless. Kanye West Chapter 3 The Devil's Handshake Tommy and Marty hoofed it over chewed-up gravel toward the long row of warehouses and railway loading docks. It was night, but the Indian summer heat hung around the buildings like a simmering engine after a long drive. This isn't a good idea, said Marty. It's fine, said Tommy. You've never dealt with these kinds of people before, Tommy. They don't take late payments. They take fingers. Now you're being racist, said Tommy. You know why they call him the Carpet King? said Marty. It's Baldwin Park. He sells a lot of rugs. They say he rolls up the bodies inside his carpets, then hides them in industrial freezers until they dismember them. Oh my God, said Tommy. You smell that? Marty sniffed the air. No, what? Smells like xenophobia, Tommy sniffed Marty. You might want another coat of Dracar. Cute. They approached a small metal door near the ramp of the loading dock. As Tommy lifted his knuckle to knock, Marty grabbed his shoulder. Tommy, there's got to be another way. Want to try turning tricks on Sunset? said Tommy. Lips like yours, I'm sure we could get some traffic. Marty shuddered. Tommy shrugged and knocked on the door. Moments later, it opened to an eagle-faced bouncer dressed in black. He said. Hey, we're here to see Vitrosky, said Tommy. What's your name? said the bouncer. Tommy knocks. And your friend? The bouncer rolled his dark eyes over Marty. Jew? Hungarian, but he gets that all the time. The bouncer shrugged and stepped back from the door. As Tommy and Marty entered the warehouse, the temperature dropped to frigid degrees. A wild chorus of men shouting, wailing, cheering and booing echoed across the barren cathedral ceilings. You meet Vartoski before? asked the bouncer, leading them through the rows of carpets. First time, said Tommy. Whatever you do, the bouncer wagged his finger. Don't to shake his hand. He doesn't like to be touched? asked Tommy. I'm kind of a germaphobe too. Don't look at it either. It? said Marty. Just don't look. You'll see. If we're not supposed to look, how are we going to see? asked Marty, the arctic chill antagonizing his distress. You'll see. Just don't try to touch it. Marty shot Tommy a what-the-fuck-are-we-doing-here look. The bouncer led them to a mob of businessmen clamoring around a pit in the center of the warehouse. Within the pit, two men boxed with bare, bloody knuckles, their faces swelling beyond anything resembling human. With a lumbering swing, one of the boxers slammed the other in the jaw, and they both spilled to the concrete. The businessmen rushed in around them, yelling, screaming, demanding another round, a payoff. Let's get out of here, said Marty. An office door opened and an old, weathered, bent trunk of a man with a withered right hand emerged, followed by two brick-stacked goons. The rambling mob quieted as soon as they noticed him. The old man spoke in Sardonian as the crowd separated. He stood over the two fallen fighters. They resembled heaving, sweaty slabs of raw beef, after saying a few more words in Sardonian, the two goons dragged away one of the fighters to a large freezer door. Maybe you're right, said Tommy. Let's go. They turned to retreat. Tommy Knox, said the old man with the withered hand, interrupting their flight for the door. All eyes turned on Tommy like a pack of jackals with dark, thirsty, glimmering eyes. 
Vitrosky, said Tommy, trying to suppress his flight instinct. Come, join me for a drink, said Vitrosky. Tommy and Marty looked at each other, silently weighing their chances of making it out of the warehouse alive. With his withered hand, Vitrosky steadied the glass as he poured the Ararat brandy. Tommy and Marty huddled on a couch, their backs to the door. Nothing beats a clean fight, said Vitrosky. Men, they scream and yell at each other. Words are for cowards. There's something noble about two men beating the shit out of each other. He's honest, no? The fists don't lie. They only have one thing to say. I'm more of a treadmill kind of guy, said Tommy. But whatever gets the blood pumping. Vitrosky chuckled as he handed them the brandy. We uh, appreciate you making the time to meet with us, said Tommy. Kasparian told me you used to invest in theaters back in the day. I don't know much about TV, said Vitrosky, taking a seat across from the couch. But I had a friend that got rich off a shopping network. I like that Seinfeld, though. He funny for a Jew. Marty chuckled nervously and took a swig. Well, this show we're developing. We already have a distribution deal with UBS. We're just looking for a backer to invest in the pilot, the, the first episode. Once it gets picked up, the network will carry the budget from there. You'll get your money back, plus you'll take a share of the royalties. If they don't pick up this pilot, asked Vetrosky. Not possible, said Tommy. They offered the distribution deal the same day we pitched. That never happens. This show is going to change the way we watch TV. I understand that you are blacklisted from the networks, said Vetrosky. They say you caused the worst scandal in TV history. That's overstating it a bit, said Tommy. They call you... Yeah, what was it? Um, the, the Charlie Mason of reality television. That was a tabloid article. Blew the whole thing out of proportion, really. What happened? Said Vitrosky. Tommy adjusted his tie. Well... He looked at Marty, who was sweating worse than the condensation on his glass of brandy. It was the first season of Gender Wars. We'd whittle the contestants down to two teams, three feminists and two men's rights activists. One of the feminists, a guy, actually, he kind of went a little crazy on the island, sort of murdered two of the MRAs, kind of hacked them up with an axe a bit. One of them happened to be a woman, actually, and, and well, the media jumped all over it, turning the, the tragedy into a political circus and, and kind of blame me for creating a hostile environment for a group of borderline personalities. One of the goons ambled into the office, wiping blood from his hands with his handkerchief. Tommy gulped and adjusted his posture. Marty downed another swig. Gentlemen, said Vitrosky, allow me to introduce you to Mike number one. Aegeus. Tommy and Marty nodded and smiled. Aegeus grunted. What do you mean by hostile environment? asked Vetrosky. Um, well, um, Tommy struggled to focus on Vetrosky as the goon loomed in the blur of his peripheral vision. The, the role of a producer is to find conflict, so we tend to seek out personalities with what some might call inadequate coping mechanisms. My job is to hunt down people's pressure points and provoke them into conflict. I kind of wind them up. Uh, but what they do from there is their own responsibility. It just so happened, since President Warren was running for re-election, gender issues were getting a lot of heated rhetoric. So the media pounced on the story, painted me as a pariah and tried to pin the murders on me. Some people even said I cost the president her second term. Tommy took a drink. When it went to trial, I was acquitted of reckless endangerment. But the bonfire was already set to my reputation. Nobody would touch me from any of the networks. In a way, that's how you know the show's going to succeed. How do you mean? Few people hate me more than UBS. Yet they want the show so bad, they're willing to work with me despite the fact they think I'm the devil. 
Are you the devil, Mr. Knox? Vetrosky toyed with his eyes. If there was a devil, I could teach him a few tricks, Tommy smiled. Victoria Archibald carved her bloody steak like a surgeon removing a tumour. She sat at a booth reserved for her and two other development executives from UBS in the back corner of Boa Steakhouse. They were reviewing the numbers from last quarter, debating whether to cut half the new lineup or just decapitate the budgets across the board. Suddenly, a ruckus broke out near the entrance as waiters shuffled around a man storming through the restaurant. Emerging through a flutter of white shirts and serving towels was the face she dreaded, Tommy Knox. The last thing she wanted was to be seen with him in public. Tommy beelined it for her booth and shoved his way onto the bench. He smelled of raw meat and brandy. Sliding plates and glasses aside, he dropped a worn shoebox on the table. What the fuck, Knox, said Archibald. The fuck indeed, said Tommy, with his wry grin. Before we do this, I want to make something clear. I'm the showrunner. What's in the box? A million in cold, hard currency. Jesus, did you rob a bank? It's my nuts on the chopping block, said Tommy. If we're going to do this right, we're doing it my way. Archibald lifted the lid of the shoebox and spied stacks of hundred-dollar bills jammed like careless socks in a drawer. She raised her eyebrows, almost impressed, then shook her head. Finishing off her wine, she wiped her mouth with a serviette and sat back. Let's play ball. On the next episode of The Profit Margin. There will be no hiding place for you, and the righteous shall sit in virtuous pleasure as you stain the earth with your blood and rot with festering sores. Think of it as a religion for the information age. Scientists offer facts. Prophets offer meaning. And I think you're the prophet we're looking for. The full audiobook of The Profit Margin is available now at cinematocore.com. Have you always wanted to be able to do accents and impressions? Have you ever tried to learn? It's hard, isn't it, trying to find YouTube tutorials and string together videos of people talking? That's why we've invented something called Accentify. Hi, I'm Bo Thomas, and I narrated this book, The Profit Margin. And you might have noticed I do some accents in there. Well, I'm also an accent and dialect coach. And we're developing an app called Accentify to help people learn accents free from home without needing to pay for a coach, but with the same level of feedback. And you can get this app for free by signing up to the wait list at www.accentify, that's A-C-C-E-N-T-I-F-Y, dot co dot uk not dot com i'm english and if you do this you will be the first to know when accentify releases which should be very soon it also helps us pitch to investors so it's very helpful for me as well lastly if you'd like to hire me for any of your voiceover projects or for accent coaching itself you can contact me at bothomasvo at gmail.com or bo at accenthelp.co.uk I'd love to hear from you.